I'm Eva Funderburg. I'm an artist working in sculpture and installation, and I'm here to talk about my exhibit at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, Mythical Worlds. Mythical Worlds is about a series of creatures that I've been working on for the last 15 years. The oldest piece in the show is about 10 years old, and so it's really amazing to me as an artist to get the chance to see how these beasts have evolved over the last decade. One theme that goes through the whole show is using these creatures, as I call them, these beasts, as stand-ins for people. Though again, that's, that's not quite right because they're more than just stand-ins for people. I choose to work with them just because they're so emotive, so fluid, and it allows me to really highlight the body language of the sculptures. By stripping down a lot of the details of the forms and really focusing on the movement, I feel that the creatures connect with the viewer more deeply and more easily. One day I was rereading a text that I'd first found in college, and that is Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. And there was a theory in there that suddenly made me look at my own work again with a new light. And that is just the idea that the more complicated an image, the more distance there is between the viewer and the emotions. When you're perceiving an oil painting, that is clearly of a different person. You don't necessarily put yourselves in the shoes of the person in the oil painting. But as you strip that image down and simplify it more and more, those barriers are removed. And... In Scott's book, he wrote about how this is really part of the intrinsic appeal of comics. In my own work, I suddenly looked at that theory and at the direction my art had been evolving made so much more sense. The simpler the form, the easier it is for the viewer to look at that creature and to feel those emotions. It's so funny, sometimes I give them butts. Quadrupeds don't have butts like that, but it's a very simple thing to be like, oh, this creature is now starting to mimic some of the human forms like the shape of the hips or the movement of the legs. I will deliberately choose not to reference animal anatomy as I'm working on them. I don't necessarily need to look at the way a horse's joints work in their legs because I'm not trying to create a horse. I'm trying to create the impression of a horse. And in that way, the way that the legs move in your mind is a lot more valuable than the way the legs move in real life. A lot of the work I have in the show, a lot of my larger, more complex pieces, really the idea ends up just marinating in the back of my mind for months before I actually tackle it. I'll work through things with sketches, and then also I'll often do tiny clay maquettes, just little studies where I'm trying to figure out if I can capture the gesture I want or what the proportions of the overall piece need to be. The technique I use for my clay creatures is actually one of the very most basics, the ones that many people I'm sure in say second grade or whenever, if they've ever taken a clay class or had a clay day in arts, art class, they've made a pinch pot. As you stick your thumb in, you pinch around, and then you have a little thing that uh, back when I first made one in the 90s was an ashtray, now it's a coin jar, but it's a very universal technique. And even as my creatures scale up, I've been keeping the same technique of just making really giant pinch pots and then connecting them together in a way that creates just a really giant bean. At that point, it's basically like working with a balloon. I can sculpt the clay, I can move the clay around, I can just person handle the clay. <laughs> I could just take the clay and just like be really relatively rougher to it than you can with a lot of sculptural methods and I'll get the general shape of my creature, stick legs on, all of that, and I spend a lot of my time just refining that sculpture. And I remove so much clay from the sculptures. As I'm going, especially with a large sculpture like Mother Night, I'm just left with this beautiful pile of shavings of utter mess around as the sculpture gets more and more refined and my workspace gets messier and messier. I then move on to remove my refining marks with sandpaper. Once my ceramic piece is finished, I will fire it once in a bisque kiln in my studio. And that just brings it up to about, I guess, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that firing does is it makes sure that the clay won't change back into mud. It's now stone. I'm lucky enough to have had chances to fire in multiple kilns, but right now I am managing Ken Lundemo's kiln in Seebeck, Washington. 
it's such a collaborative process with the fire and the community and all of that, that I really truly love the process. Ken Lundemo's Onagama, it's, its name is Santatsugama, which means three dragon kiln. It is about an 18 foot long tunnel built in the side of a hillside with special bricks. And you climb inside the kiln and you fill it with pots from the back forward, leaving spaces along for fireboxes where you're going to be putting more wood into the kiln as you fire it. Uh, once you've filled up the entire thing with pots and sculptures, uh, you brick up the door and then you'll have a firebox in the very front of the kiln that you fill with wood. And as you fire, it's going to take you five days and you get up to temperatures of 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The whole beast is just a wonderful fire creature because you'll get five foot of flame out of the stack, out of the chimney. And seeing as the chimney's already like 10 feet tall, it's just an incredibly beautiful sight. And it's also a real wonderful thing in terms of community. Because if you're firing for five days, every putting wood in every five minutes, you aren't going to be doing that by yourself. We generally fire with a community of nine to 15 artists working eight hour shifts around the clock. And it also takes that many artists just to make enough work to fill that kiln. As I work with my sculptures, one of the big aesthetic choices I have for every piece and actually every part of the piece is what clay do I use? Because every clay is going to react differently to the ash and the wood kiln. While you can control the look that you get coming out of the kiln by what glaze you put on it or what stains, I have a lot of fun just using different clays within one piece. I'll make the teeth out of a very white porcelain that's imported from New Zealand. I'll make antlers out of a dark stoneware that I know is going to go darker than the body clay that I use. And I've even started messing around with adding colored stains to the clay itself to try and get interesting wood firing effects, but in different colors than is typical. Swarm is actually a really good example of this. I used eight different types of clay over four different kilns or maybe five different kilns. And it was a really neat experiment for me as I'm working this large piece to say, okay, well, I have this type of clay that I mixed up. Let's see what does in this kiln versus what does in this kiln in Oregon versus what does in this kiln that says soda kiln, which is a slightly different process. And so it's a laboratory for me, in addition to being a massive installation piece. <laughs> I've actually got a background in science and so I love taking a scientific approach to, to everything, but at the same time, I don't always have the rigor that I should as I'm working on a project. So I've been pretty good as I've worked on Swarm to go through and not only write down what every clay is, but also write down the results. <laughs> there was a point where I'd gone halfway through Swarm and I was like, looking at everything, I was like, oh, I don't remember what clay this is. And I have to actually go through and check my notes, check my results, and write down the information so it's useful to me. <laughs> In this case, swarm is actually murmuration, which is a term for what happens when you have a thousand starlings all together and they start forming these wonderful abstract shapes. In my mind, I still think of it as swarm because it is the continuation, it's the third version of a sculpture that I keep exploring of just as many tiny flying beasts as I can in one place. <laughs> the first version was completed in 2009, and it was a project I tackled during my first ever residency. It was at a point where I was feeling a little bit constrained by the creatures that I'd started making. And I was looking for what happened when I changed them in various ways, when I pushed them in various ways. And I wrote to the Guligo Center for International Ceramic Research in Denmark and said, hey, I make these cute little things with teeth. I want to see what happens if I make a hundred of them with teeth, and if they suddenly become more scary and less cute. And they said, okay. So I went to Denmark for five weeks and made as many flyers as I could and then fired them in a wood kiln there and actually installed them all in a local middle school, which was not what I was expecting. 
I was expecting to just hang them in a closet somewhere. But the whole experience was really amazing. It was my first introduction to public art. It was my first watching people interact with my art on a large scale. And that ended up being far more meaningful to me than I predicted at all. And the other thing that was really neat with the Swarm series is it turns out just putting a bunch of things, small things with teeth in one group, it doesn't make them scary and not cute. It just amplifies everything. They become more energetic. They become more disconcerting. It turns all the dials to 11, and that's great. A few years back, when the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art reached out to me and contacted me for doing a solo show, first of all, I was amazed and delighted, but also in my dialogue with Bima, the idea of doing a new version of Swarm came up. And I was very excited for this challenge, and I was excited to see how many creatures I could make, and just to figure out the next way of growing this idea. One of the last pieces I completed for this show is called Mother Night. And I keep saying it's a favorite of mine, but in truth, I mean, they're all favorites of mine. Like, the, you can't have a favorite kid. Except you can. But it's a very fun piece because it combines two themes of two bodies of work I have. And the first is a series that I started way back a decade ago, which sort of think of the hollow forms, hollow creatures, like the piece Away in this show. And it was really investigating these pieces, looking at them in terms of being vessels, in terms of being open space, and when you opened up that space, it suddenly allowed for more explicit exploration of the emotion contained within the creature and some of the more philosophical ideas that the sculpture holds, both metaphorically and now literally. And then it also combines it with the more recent body of work they've been working on, exploring the idea of myth. And both of these ideas came together in my mind and just marinated for a long time. And what emerged was Mother Night, a large sort of water buffalo form with flowing horns, almost like hair. And this piece had a very interesting process of coming into being, partially because it's the largest sculpture I've made of this type. So it's a bit challenging there. But as I was working on it, uh, during the critical step, a bisque firing before I take it out to the wood kiln, I forgot to turn on the fan in my studio and it exploded the entire piece when it fired. I not only broke my heart, I broke the heart of like a couple thousand people who were <laughs> all watching this poor thing. But I decided to step up and not let myself get too discouraged. And on a relatively short fr time frame for my large sculptures, I just buckled down and I rebuilt the entire piece in about two weeks. Instead of our normal Anagama firing, I fired in, in my friend's soda firing. And the end result is beautiful. It's a slightly different texture and effect than I normally get from the Anagamas, but it allows the focus of the entire piece to come through on the moon and the stars. And so this piece had a very long journey to get here, but I'm so thrilled with the result, and it makes me very happy. The skulls have actually been a pretty interesting development in my work. It's something, as an artist, I started making them on the side just for the pure joy of making them. It allowed me to take my same work, but just move in a more abstract direction of highlighting the planes, highlighting the shapes. And somehow in that process, they've cycled back and converged with my creatures. And I don't know for sure that they're the skulls of my creatures. In fact, I find that sort of disconcerting to think about, especially because all of the skulls have eye holes and the creatures don't have eyes. But they're just another way of letting me play with the shape of the clay and the same philosophical ideas. It's just been really magical seeing mythical worlds come together and to see this creation of the last 10 years of my work and to have it be accumulation of this series that I've been working on for 15 years. And I'm just so thrilled to share this with the viewers and to invite them into this special world. Mm -hmm.